listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Tony Guerra, a very special person in my life. He is our veteran podcaster on the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And he always says returning to the mothership or calling us the mothership podcast. And Tony, it is um, just wonderful to be with you right now and talking with you. And we don't catch up enough. So welcome to the mothership. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I uh, always think of you as the uh, Ravens head coach because uh, all the Ravens assistants go on to coach at other other uh, uh, teams and and you just are developed podcasters and some stay and some go. But uh, I don't know. I've just just not ever been able to leave the nest. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You don't you don't actually even need the nest anymore. You've done so many <laughs> things with your with your own podcast focusing on residency, the pharmacy resident um, residency podcast. And sure. boy, residency is changing. And that's kind of what I wanted to get in with you today. I really wanted to dig in the state of the nation of residency, the state of the nation of our pharmacy industry. The fact that the reason why we haven't had enough content around that topic is because health system pharmacy is where we have the least amount of content in comparison to our our sweet spots, which are community pharmacy and specialty pharmacy, and even talking around technology. But residency to me has always been um, kind of a question mark because of how it's changing um, and also how other sectors of pharmacy are digging deeper into the resident process in order to assure that it's the right place, the right career path for the pharmacist, pharma, um, MSL, uh, even artificial intelligent residencies for, for pharmacists is, is, yeah. is exploding. So I want to give you the floor and just give our listeners updates on the state of the nation of, of pharmacy residency. Um, well, unfortunately, the data to actually tell us what happened uh, will not be out till March uh, on match day. Uh, but I can tell you what happened last year and, and what we might see uh, this year. So what was kind of surprising about last year is that the number of people applying for residency went down by about 900. And that caused a s tremendous increase in the percentage of applicants that were accepted. So after you got uh, the interview, the acceptance rate was about 67% two years ago. And then last year it was almost 77%. So you're almost four out of five. And I know that you had uh, sent me the notes where uh, they'd really tried to target 2020 as enough uh, residency placements for uh, everyone that wants one. But it's reasonable that that's going to actually happen by 2025. And I'll try to take you uh, through the journey here. So each of the next, including this year, each of these three years, we're going to lose about 500 pharmacy graduates. So this year, next year, and the year after that. But then the year after that, it's closer to 2,000 um, because of the enrollment. So interest in residency has gone down. We don't know why necessarily. Uh, we know that fewer are participating in the workforce, but we don't know if it was maybe that was a blip or maybe that's a trend, and we won't know that till March. But uh, right now, uh, many in community have felt that they were stuck. I think you also mentioned as well. Mm -hmm. And the chances have never been better to move from community to a residency to a hospital position if somebody wants it. So it's just a, a really exciting time as things just get turned upside down uh, in pharmacy. And it really is, uh, if you want a residency, it's, there's a reasonable chance that you're going to be able to get one. You know, I think of the so-called match process and how it seems to be uh, controlled and dictated um, around mid-year and around the ASH, or A ASHP, and it makes sense, the leading organization for health system pharmacy. Mm -hmm. However, with the online world expanding, virtual expanding, how the pandemic taught us that um, – that we can get a lot done um, via the, the, the Zoom call per se, or virtual um, call. Do you see technology starting to implement some changes to the residency process and pulling it out of just being controlled by 
the standard, um, which is obviously ASHP and nothing against ASHP at all. I'm just thinking of the world of moving a little faster and also getting results back uh, quicker than um, kind of the anticipation that's created around the status quo. Yeah, no, you, you've actually hit the nail on the head, um, which is that uh, especially the the leading uh, residencies, those that let's call them the Harvards of the residencies, or uh, you're in you're in Pennsylvania, so the Pitts and Penn States of residency, right? Or it would be Wharton, uh, the Wharton School over at Penn. Uh, but uh, that what's happening is, is that because of the pandemic and everything went virtual, the site said, "Well, why don't we just do our own?" And that way it'll be smaller. The chaos won't be there. We'll actually get to know applicants quite a bit. And what happened was that once we went in person, that never stopped. So some programs didn't go, although my understanding is that ASHP had more programs than they've ever had. Um, That is possibly uh, because of growth, possibly because they're concerned they're not going to get residents uh, with the number going down. But the thing is is that now uh, more than ever, you will have, besides ASHP, you will have an opportunity to actually talk to the program uh, in some way or another in one of those smaller groups. And that's because of the technology. Now, the big thing on the Reddit boards and social media is uh, many of the applicants are rejecting programs that are requiring in person. And that's mostly for those that would be out of state. So if you say we are doing in person only, Uh, you are basically locking in a very regional group. Uh, And maybe people will fly there, but uh, my daughters and I just went to Arizona to visit my parents, and it was almost three or 400 a person uh, to get there. And I've got three kids, so, you know, (laughs) it's just, you know, to go to 12 residency sites is just uh, unreasonable. Uh, So I think you're going to see a contraction where uh, it's going to be very, very regional, even more so than it than it was before. Doctor Glaucoma Flecken, one of my most yeah, favorite yeah. social media guys, um, he um, did an amazing, um, you know, uh, uh, take on residency and how uh, <laughs> basically making fun of the system and how expensive it is for um, for our pharmacists and our physicians and our nurse practitioners that are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get themselves to where they are. And now they have to spend an additional X number of plane tickets and, um, you know, processes to get to the, where the, um, where the, um, you know, interview takes place. And so, you know, bravo on, on your insight. You've been talking about this for quite some time. Where do we merge the world of, we're on StreamYard right now, um, yep. Zoom, um, you know, uh, Riverside FM, all of these platforms that are are becoming excellent in producing um, interaction to the point that it's now um, CMS reimbursable to be on a platform with your physician and or your pharmacist and getting care. And now they're reimbursing for that. So if it's good enough for our patient slash pharmacist slash, you know, physician environment, why is this not the way to go in the world of residency and interviewing? Well, eventually, I think, and this is way down the road, but eventually the resident wouldn't actually have to move there. Uh, many residents worked virtually. They, the charts were sent to them via secure email or secure whatever. Uh, they had the software at home. Uh, they did what they needed to do with the patient, uh, and that was taken care of. So I think that the promise of pharmacy, let's go back to what the promise of pharmacy was 80s, 90s, whatever, is that you're going to have a steady job that's going to allow you to be with your family, uh, that's going to provide that flexibility so you can go part-time, still have a decent income, uh, and have a great quality of life. And I I have that now, but not with a traditional pharmacy role uh, in teaching at a community college. But uh, people are saying it's much less important for me to go into whatever role as it is that I want to spend time with my kids on the weekend and coaching them and, and being able to take them to their activities and, and those types of things. So I think where everything meets and and you've always been the technology leader, because I think if we go way back to when you started the pharmacy podcast and even before that, you were a tech guy, uh, if you want to call yeah. it that. And I think what's going to happen is the technology will allow pharmacy to come back to its promise and its promise of providing 
a flexible position that is respected and that also has uh, a decent salary attached to it so you can support your family. I think that's what the technology needs to do. And I think we, we need to get away from this, oh, I'm going to be at a hospital for 80 hours a week, instead saying, okay, well, what of those activities do I actually need to go to the hospital for? Mm -hmm. You know, yes, maybe I'll do rounds, but, you know, what could I have done from home? What could I do remotely? Uh, and what can I do remotely? I think during the pandemic, you were one of the groups that that was helping with appies, uh, making yeah. sure those were remote and the students could graduate. So I think that the next kind of piece is how do we make pharmacy uh, family friendly, uh, for lack of a better word, or work life balance friendly, uh, things like that. That's true. And and being able to take advantage of the technology to then um, backfill um, some of the needs for special specialists, um, yep. someone who specializes in titration from uh, one jack inhibitor to the next in, in saying, who's the expert in this? Oh, there's some guy over in, um, you know, in San Diego, California, that's a specialist. And then you oh, start yeah. engaging. I think that that is um, part of the future of pharmacy, the part of the uh, future of accessing through through data. What I want to know is, you know, where and where is the process, um, the the process czars, right? The <laughs> yeah. are, are there are there control mechanisms that they're afraid of change that they're not going to allow this to take place? And if that were the case, which I know it is, um, <laughs> where? Where where do we comfort those control points of saying, hey, we can loosen this because of the way that virtual is changing medicine, uh, virtual interactions changing medicine. So therefore, the process of residency and the process of data gathering and sharing and collaboration, that can also uh, change with, with what we believe in uh, as the process of, of pharmacy residency. Well, let, let's start with the, the issue that we had maybe five years ago was that a residency was, you know, this very difficult thing to get. Uh, it was, you mentioned in your email, the supply demand issue, uh, mm -hmm. that the supply of people that wanted the residency is much higher uh, than the, the, than the you know, number that are available. But now that's going to cross. And I, I know you're old enough to know the Ghostbusters never cross the streams. <laughs> but what's going to happen is, is the number of students applying for residency will be lower than the number of residency spots available. I predict within three years, because that'll be when that huge drop comes. Uh, so barring a catastrophic economic condition where uh, students are not getting jobs right out of school, where they have to go to residency, uh, that's going to happen. It already happened in PGY2. So just a reminder, the PGY-1 is that general uh, residency and the PGY-2 is more specialized. When the match was over, there were more spots for PGY-2 than there were people that were, that were still available. So there were more spots available than people that were trying to get them. Uh, and so that's going to happen to PGY-1 in a couple of years here, if the trend continues, if the trend continues. Um, so kind of back to your, your question about the, the technology and how all this is going to come together and your show, the Pharmacy Podcast Network has done a great job of technology ac all across the board. I think it comes back down to um, what is it that we can do to increase the number of people that are going to be interested in pharmacy? Because uh, we're looking at about, I think, another 7% drop this year. Uh, in the number of applicants to pharmacy school. Uh, and that is continuing to happen because they're hearing from their parents who are working and they're hearing from the technicians and the technicians are working uh, that the conditions are very difficult and that the flexibility and that promise of having the job where they're caring for people, having time to work with the people uh, is not there. And when you reverse that trend, then I think the trend uh, of students coming in will, will reverse. But back to the residency thing, uh, I think that we do need those specialists, uh, but I'm excited that, that there will be a spot for everyone very soon. One of my favorite blogs that gives me some clarity and insight to so many different topics. If you're not reading TLDR Pharmacy and you're oh, a yeah. pharmacy, 
then shame on you. But uh, what an amazing blog. And I did have a, a portion in there where, you know, um, the, the TLDR, he points out 143 accredited schools. Um, the number of full-time enrollments has increased on average by 2.7% annual since 1990, but growth appears to be leveling off in recent years. And then your updated information with what's going to be happening over the next five years kind of even changes that even a little bit more into focus. So the data acquired from that match statistic process shows us what's happening up into and past a little bit by the, the, the pandemic. But some of the demographics that you just shared with us, Tony, I think starts to, to show a little bit different picture in the, in the future of residency for pharmacists. Yeah, what do you, for sure. What do you think's going to be happening? And, and I know that you don't have a crystal ball, but um, you've really tracked this, in my opinion, more than anyone based on your constant clarification and documentation through audio um, through the uh, Pharmacy Residency Podcast. So what do you, what do you think is going to take place now um, two years into the future? Uh, well, it's going to happen this year, I think, too. Um, but I think that you're going to see that residencies are going to turn things around. It's, uh, it's going to be turned upside down on its head where uh, maybe a couple of years ago, there was, uh, we, we use this word entitlement uh, for, for a different, very different reason, but there was very much a, maybe an elitism uh, that, you know, where residency will let you know if you're good enough. But all of a sudden, they're hearing that many residencies last year didn't match uh, it, the number that didn't match, and this is the residencies, not the resident or the applicants, doubled uh, last year, and that could go up again. And as the number of residencies go up and as the residencies start not matching, um, that's one place where they're going to be like, whoa, I'm not going to have a ticket to the ball. I'm not going to have a resident. The other thing is, is that the, I don't want to use the word quality, the choice residence sees have has gone way down. So if you look at the data on the ASHP match stats, the average residency got around their um, third choice. That's not right. A 3.0 ratio. And so the, the way that that ratio works is if you have eight residents, you went down to your 24th pick on average. So somewhere in that residency class of eight, they are the 24th choice. We're on the resident side, it's the opposite. Uh, 90% are going to get first, second, or third choice. Uh, so the match is it's widening, and the residencies are going to have to become more attractive, whether um, <laughs> it sounds like you're going to a beauty parlor, but <laughs> <laughs> they need to be more attractive. What makes a residency more attractive is better quality of life, better pay, better working conditions, uh, better uh, you know, teaching certificates, research, all those things. And so ultimately, uh, it's a really good thing that's going to happen is that the, the residencies will actually level up as they're looking to get better and better students. Uh, so it's a, it's a great, great thing happening. But tell me a little bit more about some of the residencies that you talked about that were kind of out of the way. You know, we have the hospital residency, the community residency, uh, managed care to some extent, not always uh, ASHP accredited. But tell me about maybe some of the interesting residency aspects that you've heard of, especially with technology, because I was just like, whoa, that's cool. AI during residency, that just seemed really neat. Yeah, so MIT has had a professional um, development residency um, in their technology and coding department that included artificial intelligence. And within that artificial intelligence they actually had a participant that was a farm D slash MBA. So um, having that kind of pullback of understanding medication management and the evolution of artificial intelligence, as well as the, um, the current events uh, around um, voice activation and in combining with AI, as well as the run amok um, chat bots that are, are, are now involved with medical driven accessibility of content and libraries and things like Medispan and quickly accelerating decision trees um, based on what a physician or a pharmacist decides to do. So there, there is no question in my mind over the next few years 
that farm d's that are technology i mean every farm d is a little bit of a nerd but then you heighten the <laughs> level of nerd and nerd level 10 Computer nerd. <laughs> and coding you know pharmacist that loves code that is also into ai and so i see um the development of um, artificial intelligence and what that means for medication management um, as well as uh, schools out there who invest in um, professional development like mit for example um, you know, investing in medical grade um, residencies that that are around artificial intelligence, and that's that's just one that I I know that is is out there and living and breathing. Um, you know, community pharmacy, um, the CPSN network um, is all about you know community pharmacy residency now. now. And I've even seen one offs where um, state associations are um, embracing the uh, community pharmacy residency program, as well as specifics under that umbrella that include disease state management that, that start to concentrate on you're doing a residency in community pharmacy, but we want you to focus just on diabetes management. And then all of a sudden they they, they get involved with digital therapeutics and, um, and instrumentation and, and tools like Dexcom and, and um, and, uh, and our Omnipods and other things like that. So that excites me too, because it gives a research element and a research component to community pharmacy residency. And I think it starts to pack it with a lot more interesting variables of being a pharmacist and attaching that back to patient care to make it sexier. Because every time you say the word residency in pharmacy, they immediately think of the hospital system uh, environment yeah. because it's only been it was the traditional environment and that's just not the case today we're seeing um, residencies bloom out of um, other um, other sectors of of healthcare and pharmacy well let's talk about actually the what what might happen on the flip side so i've said how uh, it might get easier to get a residency the number of applying for residency might go down uh, and that uh, you know, residencies are going to be uh, entertaining, whining and dining uh, the, the future hopeful residents, uh, and that's going to work out. Uh, let, me, let me give you another possibility, which is, um, so some schools have made some significant strides in terms of making pharmacy school affordable. And my belief is right now that with inflation as it is, with the kind of, uh, I want to say, there's, there's certainly a group of non-traditional students that are a bit older that have little interest in, in spending another year in school, or maybe their spouse has little interest in them spending a, another year in residency or something like that. And I know University of Illinois, Chicago, I believe Idaho State, um, and then there's one in South Carolina uh, also, uh, will allow you to go to school there for in-state tuition. Uh, no longer charging that extra out-of-state fee, you know, reducing tuition by about 60 or 70,000 over those four years. And then the University of Utah actually provides free tuition to all students now uh, coming into this next PharmD class. So if pharmacy school becomes more affordable, if students have a much lower debt load, I think that we might see quite a few more students applying to residency. But if you've got a spouse, especially if you've got kids and, and all of that, and you've got to explain to your family member how you're going to move to another state to make a third or a half of what you could have made after they've patiently waited four years for you to graduate, uh, that, that's a tough sell. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a really tough sell. Um, so it, it might, might go the other way uh, where uh, pharmacy school does become much more affordable. Uh, as these next years come. I think that it um, brings into, um, into thought and in being able to see different opportunities of the future is how many places do we, do we put a farm D who wants to be, um, wants to be ultra focused to a specific care track or treatment track the pediatrician pharmacist, um, mm -hmm. the cancer specialist pharmacist, the uh, maybe a specific cancer pharmacist, uh, endometrial uh, cancer, for example, um, just focused just on that disease state. 
therein lies tracks of residency in the future. If you really want to dig down into the specialties um, that open up opportunities that could be research driven and not necessarily premise in that you have to literally be at that location. Like we started out in, in talking at the very beginning of, of the interview that virtual has opened the doorway for so many other um, opportunities for our 300 and 500,000 active pharmacists in the, in the country and how those positions will be gobbled up by other non, they call it non-traditional pharmacist. And I don't like that term. Yeah. Because yeah. Every pharmacist is a, could, today is, is transforming into what they're deeming non-traditional. So I, I find residency just as attacked in its status quo uh, version uh, as the rest of our entire industry, right down to how, um, you know, Kyle McCormick, Dr. McCormick doesn't even take insurance anymore at Blueberry Pharmacy. And he's telling the PBM to go pound salt. So um, <laughs> everything has changed. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the blessing of being a veterinarian uh, for the, those uh, uh, that have pets uh, where you just, it's just cash. Uh, and it's just uh, makes it makes it so, so much easier. Uh, but you did. I did want to mention the the letter of intent, which is part of the yeah. residency process. And and uh, this is something I do with a lot of students. And, and I think it's misunderstood. So in a traditional cover letter, when you're trying to write to a uh, an employer and say, hey, this is why I think that we're a good fit and, and kind of put your own thing there past the CV. Uh, much like somebody might say, hey, you know, I'd like to be on the podcast, and, and they kind of give you a little bit of a letter. Uh, the letter of intent with residency is, is very different, and and there's kind of two things that happen. Either somebody just finds a letter of intent, fills in the blocks, I'm ha I'm, I wanted to express my deep interest in blank, and I met the residents blank at ASHP, uh, and so on, and, and it's a very generic letter. But another uh, smaller group, takes that time to really reflect on the last three years and how that program can get them to where they want to go. And those are the people that I work with at residency.teachable.com. And what we're able to do is there's 4,000 residencies and you only get 12 shots. So it's like being at the, you know, at the carnival or the fair, you only get three darts, right? To shoot at the balloon. And, and there's, you know, a hundred balloons out there and you, whichever one you pop, you get that prize or whatever. And you only get 12 shots. And I think that being mindful about that letter and reflecting on it is what allows you to, to figure it out and, and to write the letter over and over again, to make mistakes I know that when I started podcasting, my first podcast was uh, a little segment with Aaron. And then I think it was um, Pharmacy Future Leaders, mm -hmm. then Pharmacy Leaders Podcast and Pharmacy Residency Podcast. And just as the uh, Pharmacy Podcast Network has grown and transformed, uh, I've had my own little transformation within the, the podcast and who I serve. I think that it's important to figure out where you are where you want to be. And the toughest thing though, is to not be where your professors want you to be, to, to kind of say, okay, what's my niche? Because every one of your podcasters has a niche. It's just, yeah. that's their, their you know, chunk of the world. So how, did, how do you develop, I always take over the podcast. How do you develop individual podcasters? Because you have done this with, it, it's going to get close to a hundred soon, but certainly dozens of podcasters. How do you help someone develop their own? And I hate this word brand, but how do you help them develop their own voice maybe mm -hmm. uh, within the podcast? Cause uh, you as a mentor were just so instrumental in allowing me to, to start with students, to talk to them, then to talk to the leaders and then to say, you know, the, the one thing that I really, really think is misunderstood is residency. I like writing. You hate writing. Let's come yeah. together and I can help you do your writing because that's the one little little place I wanted to help people, whether it's CV or, or letter of intent. Um, how, how have you been that kind of uh, nurturing, um, nurturing grand poobah podcaster uh, that helps uh, so many people in their defined space? Yeah, it's um, my role is to is to stop trying to be someone else and just do your own thing 
shout out to Dr. Jamie Wilkie, who um, oh yeah, <laughs> beat that up. You know, she's like, quit trying to be someone else. Be yourself. Um, find your niche in a niche in a niche, and um, and hammer at home because you, as an individual, have very specific ideas about a residency, about a sector of pharmacy, about drug development, um, residency in clinical trials. There is no such thing. Why not? Why aren't we developing a good clinical trial management um, uh, executives and people that lead um, the sensitivity around uh, cl clinical trials? Why isn't that a residency? Um, and, and, it, and it will be in the future, I'm, I'm sure, because there's going to be other accelerated paths of drug development that are going to need that kind of focus. But to back to your question, I only like to guide people by removing obstacles. I do not like to guide people by telling them where to go. I don't tell my podcasters where to go. I say, here's the obstacle. Stop worrying about the way your voice sounds. We'll make sure your microphone, you know, gets improved or, um, you know, stop overthinking the show notes. Please don't give me eight pages of show notes because <laughs> you know, we, we, can't, <laughs> we can't take them. Um, so it's all about removing the obstacles of what I've banged my head against the podcast tree um, and, and trying to say to that individual, Here's how I, how the network can remove the obstacle of, of, of accelerating your listeners because we're going to get you to um, thousands of listeners in the time that it would have taken you five years or 10 years to get to that same level. That's one power of the network. And another is, like you said, building their voice but echoing their voice. So I'm an amplifier. If someone told me, you need an elevator statement, and I said, I have one word, amplify. You know, That's what I do. I amplify. I amplify the voice of pharmacy and I, I do it better than anyone because I know how to do it because I've had to do it in order to make money. I had to leave my um, 150 <laughs> plus bonuses realm. My, my wife reminds me often of what I left in order to become a permanent full-time podcasting publishing entity. And in order to do that, I had to have enough revenue and enough worth to my client, to my customer, to my listener to my podcasters, to my hosts, in order to make it work and, and level up. And we're going in so many directions now with continuing education and uh, supplementing uh, journal articles and the poster, um, walking up to a poster and scanning the QR code and listening to the um, author's um, you know, 11 or 10 minute um, uh, idea of why they have invested this time in this poster and where that's going. I mean, all of these things came from the very first TE podcast in the world uh, for, for pharmacists, dedicated to pharmacists, came from the PPN because I said, why isn't continuing education in a podcast? And someone's like, no, that won't work. And I'm like, well, why won't it work? So I grab my Rubik's Cube and I start twisting and twisting and twisting. And you don't have to necessarily solve it all but you definitely have to come up with enough so that you can get the subject matter expert to come in and backfill. And that's what we're doing. So it's um, podcasting is just in its beginning. We know that there are 161 million listeners just in the United States. And these are people that keep coming back, coming back. The world of pharmacy is changing. So therefore my publication, our publication has to follow suit and, um, I'm excited what we're going to be doing in 2023 and the new show coming out called uh, This Week in Pharmacy, which you're going to have to be a guest on that. It's going to it's going to merge the uh, consumer listener with the uh, My Sweet Spot, which is the B2B uh, pharmacist okay. to pharmacist listener. And um, it's going to demystify pharmacy a little bit, but it's also going to be a I've been waiting for a public relations company to come along and say the only thing we do is public relations for pharmacists. And I'm like, well, I'm tired of waiting for that to happen. So <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do it myself. Well, they need you, that's for sure, <laughs> or the schools do. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a school I just visited. Uh, just visited UConn uh, School okay. of Pharmacy. A shout out to Dr. Uh, Rick Crow, Rick, Rick Crow. And, um, you know, their their team there is a, the reason why I went up there is my, uh, my godson Jelani is there. Um, is one of their uh, defensive uh, linemen, and and he um, he's been doing a, an amazing job. And I got to meet um, um, their team. I got to go to the football banquet. Um, 
uh, I got to to meet up Jim, the one and only coach Jim Mora uh, from you know Huskies, and and then I got to meet with a pharmacy school. So I was elated for that weekend. It was one of my uh, favorite weekends in the closing of of 2022. And um, now it's time to involve pharmacy schools in supplemental education information that comes from their cohort. So I'm taking the P2, the P3, and the P4s, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start picking pharmacy schools to develop content for their fellow classes and and helping to accelerate understanding and sharing and sandboxing. And so we'll see what happens, but we have 10 pharmacy schools um, kind of uh, on our target and we'll see what happens in 2023 and if something can come from that. But I'm still looking for a host for pharmacy future leaders. We we need to resurrect (laughs) that. That um, I can't. I know I'm not going to get you to come back, but you were the best host ever for that podcast. But we I, need. I, I, need a host. I, I love doing it. Uh, I loved having the, the students on there. So maybe, maybe we'll see about 2023. We'll see what happens. So yeah, you have uh, so much going on. I want to share with the listeners uh, an update for your um, your your personal world, uh, your amazing uh, triplets and and soccer stars and. Uh, <laughs> and one of your yeah. daughters is now a marathon runner, um, winning her her father's heart. Oh, and, uh, 5K runner, but but yes, yes, she is. So she she didn't make a whole marathon. So that's incredible, though. Yeah, that, yeah. That, you put that as part of their life. That part of their life is the the physical side and the 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 spirit of competition is so uh, evident in your world, and it and it's very healthy competition. I don't I don't see your uh, daughters yet becoming. Um, out of control uh, competitors yet, I guess. Not yet, not yet. But, but, yeah. uh, but no, and, and, and kind of to, to kind of wrap this all up, uh, I was able to enjoy, you know, that community career in the beginning that kind of set me up to, to take the lower pay for a while as I went to a, a job that would take years to, to build up to the pharmacist salary, which I eventually got to. But Uh, It fulfilled its promise to me because I was able to be their coach. I am there nights and weekends uh, to to see them, to drop them off. But I'm also a good partner to my wife in terms of sharing the load. And I think that that's a really tough thing. Um, The number of weeks you leave in the year is the number of days I leave in the year. (laughs) So it's it's uh, amazing how how you know how important the support is there, uh, and then to to kind of uh, give back to to the family. So uh, again, I think that in the right situation with the right leaders, you you can have that um, great balance between your pharmacy career and your family life. Uh, but um, I think that it has to come from the development that you provide, which is. Uh, allowing someone to to find that initial like Jamie Wilkie did. And man, she's got the four boys, right? And then so does <laughs> Tim Ulbrich. Uh, he's got four boys as well. And uh, other people with, with many children that, that really need um, that kind of flexibility. So I don't know. I think, I think we can get it back. I think we can get it back. And, um, and even developing um, supportive, entrepreneurial ventures with your spouse that has nothing to do with pharmacy. I have to give a shout out to the very first virtual conference in pharmacy ever was by Dr. Blair Telemeyer. Yeah. And her amazing um, rush into the market that was needed so badly when she started, everybody thought she was nuts. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hit and she had been four years into it. And then everybody's like, wow, you know, Dr. Telemeyer really knew what was going on and she was a visionary. And, and now she's supporting a family owned business in the world of harvesting eggs and having a chicken farm. (laughs) And and she's a champion. Like I just like, that's a, and that's a reinvention of their family and of their, of their aspirations, but then being able to share everything and kind of tie it back to, um, healthier living. And I I think that that, that's a testimony of not giving up and and continuing to work. Awesome. Well, I thank you. Um, We have to have you back more often than once every three or four years and and being able to (laughs) get your mind share about um, about the, the what is pharmacy and what's happening in pharmacy and how residency plays a part in this. So if something um, takes place over the na- next two years that we can go back to this recording and say, see, 
Uh, told, Dr. You. Garrett, told you so. <laughs> told you so. Told you yeah. so. Told you so. <laughs> But um, I appreciate you and your support of not only the network, but of our of our industry and your heart is in this and in it in it coming from someone that really believes in the evolution of of our pharmacists. Um, that means a lot to me because I am your hero. I mean, you are my hero and I am your fan. And as I am uh, pharmacists that are out there. So if you're listening and you want to get in touch with um, with Dr. Tony Guerra, um, what's the best email to, to send you a message to? Tony, the pharmacist at gmail.com. That'll be in the show notes. Thank you. We thank you so much for, um, for listening and everything that you're doing. And, um, with that, we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.